Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. Well, all right, Josh. We're out in the middle of an open field, just like you wanted. Now what? Ugh, just smell that. It smells like grass. But all we do, we just uh, start playing baseball. We'll montage. And boom, we'll be professional baseball players just in time for the next part of the tournament tomorrow. Montage. No. No. Just no. Dan, why are we trusting the least sports guy to teach us sports? Because I'm not making the mistake of trying to train you two again. You won last week. You two need to figure out how to win this baseball tournament. Uh, sports ball. Just like in grade school. So, I guess we should start playing. So where is the first bases? We're in a field of grass. Anywhere can be first base. I can't find it over here, Josh! Look harder! It's gotta be over there! There's what, like two or three of them? Oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, great. Ah, damn it. Guys, guys, get over to that tree over there. What was what was that? I ignore it. Just keep running! Wait, where's Josh? I'm sure he's fine out there in the uh, open field during uh, the storm. Uh, wait, is it is this safe to be under a tree during a thunderstorm? I don't know. Josh is a science guy, not me. He would know that. Hey, Josh, is it safe for you to... Oh, ah! 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 Tom! Tom? Are you okay? Did you get struck? Tom, where did you go? You guys... You guys shouldn't... You shouldn't be hiding under a tree during a thunderstorm. Yeah, well, if you'd have just come here when we were... About time... Jesus, dude, what's wrong with your arm? Oh, I... I slipped, and then I fell... It hurts really bad, but it's like, I don't know, it feels really tight. It does this weird thing when I do this. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> what? Huh? Hey guys, I think the lightning struck this branch and turned it into a baseball bat. <gasps> oh, my god. oh my god, oh my god. And then uh, Josh, and then you, and... Are you sure you just didn't find an old baseball bat that was, you know, already under the tree? Oh, that's just dumb. Guys, don't you see what's going on here? What? what? All right, I'll show you. Look, Josh, take this rock and throw it. No, 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 no. That way, that direction. Oh, so not at Tom. Yeah, no, that way. All right, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Huh? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Whoa, did, did I just... <laughs> yes, see? Now, Tom... Swing away! Right, Chief! Hi, Big Red! Wow! Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay, okay, okay. What is my magic sports thing? Uh, let's see here. Um, um no. Josh? Uh, why is he pooping? No! No! Is that what that smell is? Ugh, gross. No! You guys have magical sports abilities that will help us win the game now. Josh, you have super pitching arm. Tom, you now have a magic baseball bat. I'm trying to find out what my special thing is. You know, you might try praying for them. You know what I'm saying? Like, like this? Yeah? yeah. Uh, why? Why? Yeah. You can do it like this. See? See what I'm doing? See what I'm doing? <sighs> yes, I see it. Why would I need to pray to God for baseball powers? Yeah. And why do you keep flapping your arms like that? You look like some kind of a bird or an angel. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I got it, I got it, I got it! What, what, what is it? What you guys got? Divine Inspiration. This is going to be the best tournament ever. Yeah, let's play some baseball! <laughs> sure is still raining. Yep. You know, I don't like playing baseball in the rain or any other kind of weather, really. So you guys just want to... Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. And now your lineup. First base, we have James Earl Jones in The Greatest. Second base, we have Robert Duvall in The Natural. 
Robert Brusky in Rudy. Your shortstop, John Favreau in Wimbledon. Your catcher, Paul Bettany in A Knight's Tale. And finally, the pitcher, Alan Tudyk in 42. Then, Tom and Josh lead the fire pit into its next journey of the second season, striking out the competition and sliding into home with the classic Chadwick Boseman film about the legendary Jackie Robinson himself, 42! It's curveballs and clinch plays every Tuesday here at the Fire Pit. Play ball! Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome to another episode of the Fire Pit. I'm Dan, Rega Nigel, and we have another home run of an episode for you tonight as the Fire Pit strikes out towards 42. After watching a not-so-great movie about the greatest boxer ever, we're on to the next inning with tonight's film. And as per the rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them on over to this one. And now to let us know what we're watching and who we're watching, I toss the ball over to our cutoff man, Josh. Thank you, Nigel. Josh Cuball Reginald here. And uh, last week, we watched Darth Vader himself and James Earl Jones play Malcolm X alongside Muhammad Ali as not the greatest actor and uh if you missed three scenes of the movie you probably would have missed our connector mr robert duvall and his participation in said film but he's got a bigger role in tonight's film though tonight's film being 1984's the natural a movie about women who don't like to shave if i'm correct on that it's a baseball film josh If baseball movies had a Hall of Fame, this one would most certainly be in it. But to give you a more of a rundown on tonight's film, I'm going to go ahead and toss my balls over to Tom. One at a time there, Josh. If I got it, Reginald, thank you. Tom, the editor, Thompson here. And as mentioned before, tonight we're watching 1984's The Natural a classic baseball film starring the aforementioned Robert Duvall, along with Robert Redford and Barbara Hershey, our first female three-peat for the fire pit, as well as Wilford Brimley and Kim Basinger. What other, what was the, I know he, she was in Hoosiers and this one, what was the other movie she was in? The Right Stuff. Ah, yes. She's uh, um, Chuck Yeager's wife. That's right. Yes. Yes, but The Natural was released back in May 11, 1984, has a runtime of 138 minutes. Its budget was $28 million, which is a lot smaller than I thought it was going to be, and a box office of $48 million, another thing I thought was going to be much larger. But the ratings are about where I expected. Rotten Tomato has this at an 84% with an 88% audience score, and IMDb puts this, weirdly enough, at a 7.5 out of 10, which is actually not that weird. That's about average for IMDb. Um, If you're ready for me to go into it, I've got a little bit of meta about this film, guys. Well, gentlemen, let's get meta. Fire away. Let's get meta. So the natural tagline. From an age of innocence comes a hero for today. Summary. An unknown middle-aged batter named Roy Hobbs, played by Robert Redford, with a mysterious past, appears out of nowhere to take a losing 1930s baseball team to the top of the league in this magical sports fantasy. With the aid of a bat cut from a lightning-struck tree, Hobbs lives the fame he should have had earlier. This film is actually based on the novel by Bernard Malamud. It was actually his first novel published, uh, 1952. Highly regarded novelist, this guy, and has had several works adapted to film. Uh, The Fixer, The Assistant, The Tenants. I'm ignoring the fact that everyone says the book is better than the movie. Everyone says that about that. So I'm not holding that against this book. So far, I guess the meta we can expect from this film is good things. This film was produced by... Philip Breen, Robert Colesbury, Mark Johnson, and Robert Town, 
Um, the An Odd Collection, Philip Breen was an executive producer. He did some historical stuff, historical fantasies like Wine and the Green Knight. Uh, Colesbury is the associate producer who did a lot of good films, including The King of Comedy, a.k.a. the movie that the Joker rips off. Mark Johnson, uh, the producer, who is a name that I'm definitely focusing on when you want to know what kind of film you're going to get. This man has produced Rain Man, Good Morning Vietnam, at Galaxy Quest, and Roger, Roger Town. This is his first film, but he quit his job uh, as the story editor for Columbia Pictures to produce and write the screenplay for this film. So you have a guy who really wanted to make this film happen and also wanting to make this film happen was the returning director, Barry Levinson, who we know from this podcast from Wag the Dog. Mm, nice. Yes, he's coming off of Diner when he was taught to make this one, a, a period piece set in the 1950s. So he's got a little experience with uh, films set in the past. And from the writers, again, Roger Town and Phil Doonesbury, these are the only two that are kind of like, eh, about Roger Town. This was his first screenplay. And Phil Doonesbury, excuse me, I said Doonesbury before, it's Doonesbury. This was only his second film. The other one was called Hail, which is about... Um, a presidential advisor discovering the president has assembled a secret vigilante group to put hippies in concentration camps. You can tell that one was written during the Nixon administration. <laughs> Although weirdly about the guy, he did have some experience in advertising uh, with such memorable slogans as General Electric's We Bring Good Things to Life, Gillette Razor's The Best a Man Can Get, and HBO's It's Not TV, It's HBO. So he knows he knows yeah. how to put and it. And all, all of those are very memorable. I can actually picture the commercials in my head when I hear those slogans. So, yeah. So he's got experience making things that are memorable and also memorable. The cast of this film, which we are looking at some generational greats. Robert Redford, like we said, Robert Duvall, Kim Basinger. All three of those were Oscar winning Actors and actresses, Glenn Close, Barbara Hershey, and Richard Farnsworth, also Oscar nominees. It's amazing. Robert Redford, for those who don't know, uh, he plays Rory Hobbs. He was his generation's Brad Pitt. You probably know him from All the President's Men, Sneakers, and for us modern audiences, as Senator... Hell Hydra! Damn it, you beat me to it. Yeah, he was uh, Senator Pierce from Winter Soldier. You beat me to it, Josh. A role he did very well. He did it very well. Uh, Robert Duvall also does his roles well, playing Max Mercy in this one. This will be a four-peat for him. We've had him in True Grit, The Greatest, Days of Thunder. Um, yeah, everything he does is brilliant. Also, I learned he was actually in THX 1138, which was Lucas's first film. I don't know how... Robert Duvall yeah, I don't know how he... Yeah. So yeah. Robert Duvall then joins Dennis Hopper as a four Peter for this uh, Hopper podcast. Was a five Peter. Hopper's okay. Hopper's a five Peter. So I know we got, um, uh, I know, I know Robert Duvall's in some good company with this podcast. Cause we've got a couple of, of actors and actresses that have been, or we've only got a, one actress that's been in more than two. And that's tonight's Barbara Hershey, yeah. but um, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. continue Josh. Or I mean, Tom. Yeah, no, 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 no worries. No, again, he he joins a very auspicious group, and I hope we can get some more in his play because God, I love Ro Robert Duvall and first timer Glenn Close playing Iris Gaines, just starting out when she made this film. Um, but we now know her. Uh, the films she did before this were The Big Chill, which is a great film, and The World According to Garp. So yeah, a very highly acclaimed dramatic actress for this film. Most audiences know her as Cruella DeVille from the 96 live action 101 Dalmatians and Nova Prime from Guardians of the Galaxy. Kim Basinger playing Memo Paris, the uh, the blonde hotness from the 80s. You have seen her in a bunch of stuff here and there, most notably Vicky Vale in the 1980s Batman. So we actually have three actors or actresses in this film that have been in comic book movies. Yes, and one actress who's played a corpse in a music video, because she was also the corpse in the Tom Petty, Mary Jane's Last Dance uh, music video. And nice. Yes. And of course, Barbara Hershey as Harriet Bird, as we noted. And Darren McGavin, who plays Gus Sands, 
who I mentioned because I love him in Carl as Carl Kolchak from Kolchak the Night Stalker, and he also played Chevy Chase's dad in Christmas Vacation. So we got a really good cast behind this. Great music, too. Randy Newman did the score for this movie. We know him, of course, from doing the score for Toy Story. This was um, actually his second film, I believe, Ragtime, being the film he did before this, uh, which is set around the same time frame. So I think they looked to that film and said, yes, we want you for this. Hmm. Uh, This movie was nominated for several awards. Best Actress in a Supporting Role. Uh, cinematography, art direction, and music. And Kim Basinger was nominated for Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress. In terms of novelty, this film is included among the 1001 movies you must see before you die. So in my conclusion, guys, I think... Well, I think we're in for a solid film. We've got quality people behind the camera and in front of the camera. I don't think this is going to be the greatest, but it's going to be great. See what I did there? Because the greatest sucked. And you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to leave. I'm I'm just going to leave. Dan, do we have trivia before I? He's not. We uh, do. Oh, damn it. We're on an audio thing. I'm sitting here flashing this light, telling him to get off the stage, but he won't. I know. Yeah. Tom, Tom's meta seems to go a little long these days. But that's okay. We love Tom. So uh, I do have a little bit of trivia for this game, or not this game, this uh, this movie. Podcast, the Fire Pit Podcast, now doing video games, the natural. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're professional podcasters, ladies and gentlemen. We have almost 60 episodes. So um, <clears throat> one of my favorite bits of trivia from this film, and I do have some friends that listen to this podcast that are big pro wrestling fans. And uh, Anthony especially is going to get a big kick out of this because this is his favorite wrestler of all time. Pro wrestler Bret Hart took his catchphrase, I'm the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be from this movie. Nice. Yeah, that was Bret Hart's catchphrase. I'm the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. He took it from this film. He was watching it one night on the road and decided, yeah, that sounds like something that I should say. And now the catchphrase is, is, if you're a fan of pro wrestling, it's definitely associated with Bret Hart. I mean, I don't, if you had noted that, I probably would never would yeah if, if that had been a trivia question where is this a, who said i'm the best there is the best there was and the best there ever will be i would have said bret hart without yes. bl- th- thinking you could it. say that it was a natural association no no oh, how Ooh. to Ooh. but yeah that's <laughs> flashing the red light for josh yeah yeah you're done yeah you forfeited your uh, time josh i'll just take it from tom so uh, the other bits of trivia I have for this are actually kind of related to what they did in the movie versus um, actual baseball games or baseball moments. Um, there's a moment in the movie where Hobbs, which is the character Redford plays, breaks the scoreboard clock with a home run. It was actually inspired by an actual game uh, in 1946. Uh, Bama Rowell of the Boston Braves uh, doubling off uh, the Ebbets Field scoreboard clock on May 30th, 1946. Uh, he showered an outfielder named Dixie Walker with glass. And Bama Rao was actually promised a free watch by Beluva, which was an advertisement on the board, for hitting the company's scoreboard sign. But uh, they didn't deliver the watch until 1987. Oh, my God. <laughs> 41 years after he hit that home run. Did he even remember it by then? I don't know. It was 41 years after he hit that home run. Beluva finally gave him the watch that he was promised for hitting the uh, their advertisement sign on that billboard. Sir, this is for that home run you hit back 40 years ago? He's like, I, I, I pooped my pants. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus I met him in that out. <laughs> yeah, edit all of that out. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the patches on the left arm of the Knights uniforms, the Knights of the team that the Robert Redford plays in this movie. The Knights uniforms are special patches commemorating the centennial of baseball, which was celebrated in 1939. Um, this confirms in the movie without actually saying that the the season they're playing is actually the 1939 season mm-hmm. of baseball. Obviously, the Knights are a fictional team, but and the season actually um, went out a little bit differently. Um, How so? Well, I mean, the Knights aren't real. And if I'm not mistaken, I do believe the Pittsburgh Pirates won that game won the 1939 world series and not any team from new york although they did beat the new york yankees those damn yankees (laughs) uh speaking of the yankees winning the world series that or i mean the uh, yankees not winning the world series the pittsburgh pirates beat them with a whole run in the bottom of the ninth in the world series 
in this movie, the Knights beat the Pittsburgh team with a home run in the bottom of the ninth. And the Knights are from New York. Uh, it was actually the writer's revenge for that season because the writer of this, the writer of the book is a uh, big Yankees fan. So I thought that was kind of fun, if not a little petty. <laughs> Take that, Pittsburgh, you bums. Yeah. Um, I guess this movie depicts the very first night game in baseball, but that's actually untrue. This would depict the first night game in 1939. However, the first night game was played in 1935 on May 24th in Cincinnati. Uh, and New York didn't get a night game until 1938. But still, this this I guess this movie shows a that they're playing the Knights are playing the very first night game in baseball. But it's but not. there are the it's, Knights. That makes sense. I mean, wouldn't every game be a night game? This is your last. Is one. This no, is your no. last. No, no, you get two strikes in baseball. He's 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 got two. He's got two. I thought you got three. But, well, you get three strikes in baseball. You're on two. <laughs> You're on two. And I'm serious. I'm not even joking anymore. Okay. That's the last one. But now Josh any- made me lose my spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, the story of this movie in this book is loosely based on the story of Sir Percival from the Arth- Arthurian mythos. The broken bat is the broken sword. Pop Fisher is the Fisher King. The pennant equals the Holy Grail, which is the thing they're chasing in the movie. And the team is called the Knights. For those who don't know or are not familiar with the Arthurian legend, Sir Percival was the very first knight depicted to go after the Holy Grail in the um, King Arthur's stories. Ooh. Yeah. Modern interpretations change it to Sir Galahad, but in the original La Morte de Arthur and all that, it was Sir Percival. They called back to that in Ready Player One. Yeah. If we ever get to uh, the movie Excalibur, we can mention that. <laughs> so That would be an awesome movie to get to. It's like a four-hour movie, but it'd be awesome if we got to it. Would it though? Would it really? What Excalibur? That's a great movie. Yeah, I think. But we're not talking about that movie tonight. You might be thinking of, but we'll we'll talk about it here in a minute. But Excalibur is awesome and epic and amazing. Um, I think that's all I got. Uh, yeah, Tom. Um, I also had it written down that this was included in the 1001 movies you must see before you die by Steven Schneider. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, so that is all I have for trivia tonight i might pepper some more in as we watch the movie and as things go on uh because some of the other trivia bits i got are a little spoiler heavy and i haven't seen this movie in a while so i kind of wanted to be fresh going into it so josh since you did not strike out at the plate i'm giving you permission to give us some box office numbers well with the remaining time left i can say this line and the next oh for fuck's sake okay (laughs) okay so the natural as we know, premiered on May of 1984. It uh, premiered at number one on the box office, and it stayed at number one for two weeks. Um, any guess as to which movie displaced it? 1984? 1984. Um, hmm. when, uh, this movie was... You know this movie. Ghostbusters? Nope. Uh, Back to the Future. That was 85. Um. Before. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Oh, I do know oh, that film. Wow. Oh, nice. That displaced it on its third week of release. Wow. So. And then that movie, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, would have to wait 20 years to be displaced as the worst Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But uh, The Natural premiered at number one, pulling in $5 million on its opening week. Nice. It premiered in 989 theaters. Interestingly enough, both the second through the seventh movies on the top 10 was uh, released in more theaters than uh, The Natural. Really? So, wait, so only 900 theaters? That is a tiny number. Wow. I'm impressed. Yeah, it's uh, especially given today's t- uh, theater releases, like modern theaters or movies are released in like 3,000 theaters on opening weekend or when they have their wide release. This was released in less than 1,000. And it grossed on average $5,000 per uh, theater it made in, which was significantly higher than any others. If they would have had a wider release, it probably would have pulled in more. Yeah. But uh, it only stayed at number one for two weeks before being displaced by uh, Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. But um, it was on its fifth week of release when another big movie came out that year. And uh, do you guys care to take a whack out on this one? Baseball pun. Am I going to say Ghostbusters again? You can say Ghostbusters again. Well, then I'm saying Ghostbusters again. Tom? I'm going to piggyback off of Nigel and also say Ghostbusters. 
Gremlins uh, damn it, uh, damn it. was released the same week as Ghostbusters, and they both got number one and two spot Ghostbusters and Gremlins, respectively. No, I was thinking Gremlins in the back of my head, too. No, go, no the Ghostbusters did win that weekend. Okay. Um, it was Ghostbusters at 13 million, Gremlins at number two with 12. But The Natural, it, uh, that weekend was its first weekend outside of the, the top five. No. Um, but Ghostbusters, as we all know, stayed number one through the entirety of its uh most of the of its run at the box office mm-hmm. but uh, the natural ran from may to mid july where it ended on number 13 in the box office on its 10th week of release so that's not a bad run that's not a bad run for a baseball film no but uh, it ended on the same week that the last starfighter was released oh my god that's a that's in my the last starfighters in my movies that have i'm surprised i've been remade Mm-hmm. seriously the top five for its final week of release ghostbusters gremlins the last starfighter the karate kid and muppets take manhattan that's a great weekend at the box office that is Dude, an amazing even, weekend at the movie theater mm-hmm. not even at number six was indiana jones and the temple of doom seven was bachelor party cannonball run two Conan the Destroyer, Ooh. Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Damn, dude, that was Holy a weekend shit. at the box office. That was man. You imagine walking in the movie theater today and seeing all. Well, I can't imagine walking into a movie theater today, <laughs> but I mean, just seeing all of those movies. Like that's guys. That's like our DVD collection or a Blu-ray yeah. collection now. Like that's that's yeah. cycling through my 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 streaming library. Like Star Trek Three, Ghostbusters, Gremlins, The Last Starfighter. That's like wow. Yeah, any like online playlist like Essential 80s. That's, yeah. Those are films that are going to be pretty close to the top of the list. Man, 1984 was a good year for movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, just even out of the top 10, Conan the Destroyer, was that the sequel? Yeah, that's the yeah. sequel. Conan the, the sequel. Barbarian. So, so you had one, two, three, four, four sequels on the top 10. Yeah, until the Lord of the Rings trilogy came out, Conan the Destroyer was the best D&D movie ever. Yes. Still is. Oh my God. Yes, <laughs> it, has a, it has a perfect party. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much all I got for the box office. Like I said, 10 weeks in the box office. It pulled in uh, everything that it pulled in. I mean, it was a pretty significant pull. $47 million, almost 48. Still, I love going through the box office in the mid to late 80s because that's, you know, when box office numbers got reported because it's still crazy to see some of these movies that came out on particular weekends, you know, it's also yeah. so hard to remember that, you know, lo- uh, a year is 12 months, obviously, and lots of movies come out in a 12 month span, but sometimes we associate a particular movie with a particular year and we forget that other movies came out alongside it or was there yeah. like, so like, I, I don't associate gremlins and the natural and ghostbusters in the same year. Then I forget, no, they were, they were in the same movie theaters <laughs> at some, at one point in time, like, Someone yeah. walked in. Yeah, someone walked in with two bucks and had to decide which movie they were going to go see. Am I going to go see Ghostbusters, Gremlins, The Natural, Indiana Jones, <laughs> yeah, so. Karate Kid, The Last Starfighter? Fuck me! I don't even want to make that decision now. Yeah, it'd be Ghostbusters. It's it's, be it's, it's going to be. Yeah, we, yeah, we, be we know who you're for Although it. although I would campaign hard for Karate Kid. I love that movie. That Ooh, is a fantastic. Yes. Movie. Karate Kid would win on particular days. Yeah, but Ghostbusters more than more than not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> so Nigel, what uh now that now we've talked about the box office returns for this film, what are uh, you hoping to get out of this one? Okay, I don't remember the last time I saw this film. I know I've seen it, but I don't remember the last time I've sat down and watched this film. But I'm I'm looking at the actors and actresses in this film and I'm like just on a blind taste test so to speak. If somebody told me that I'm going to sh- you want to watch a movie tonight that's got Robert Redford and Wilford Brimley and Glenn Close and Robert Duvall and Kim Bassinger. And if you want to watch that movie, I'd be like, I, it can't be that bad. And that's how I feel about this film. I don't, I can't remember the last time I watched it, but I really think I'm going to like this movie tonight. I, I have a soft spot for baseball films, a league of their own and field of dreams are two of my favorite films of all time. And I know that this movie has been parodied, especially on the Simpsons, but I don't know. I'm just, I'm really expecting a very, very good film with a lot of top notch performances. It's on that, that list of movies you have to see before you die. It's constantly batted about as like the best baseball, the best sports movies of all time. In fact, if I remember when we talked about Hoosiers and I said that ESPN listed Hoosiers as the number one sports film of all time, mm-hmm. I believe this was the third place vote. I believe The Natural was the third place vote. I, I'll have to check on that, but 
that's what this movie's really up there with best sports movies of all time. So my expectations are really high. I'm expecting a very good film. I am not expecting what we got last week, which was Muhammad Ali unable to play himself in a film. <laughs> but that's all I've got to say about expectations. What about you, Josh? I'm kicking back to you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I honestly, I, I have seen this movie, but God, remember stand by me how i told you it's like i don't think i've seen this movie and then as we were watching it i slowly remember yeah that that's how i'm gonna th- i think i'm gonna have that kind of experience tonight mm-hmm. yeah i think me too because i remember seeing this movie i remember my dad renting it i remember us watching it but i don't remember any beats of the movie but i i'm with you too dan i love baseball movies um you know fill the dreams um i can't think of any right now for some reason a league of their own for the love of the game that I love for the love of the game, yeah, and I love dances with wolves. Yeah, there was one, there was one with Tom Selleck. I can't remember the name of it either, but I love that film, Mr. Baseball. Mr. Baseball, I love that movie. And there was another one with Bernie Mac. Was it Mr. Three Thousand? I love that one too. Like yeah, I love baseball films. Good. I love baseball films. Oh, uh, Moneyball was good. Yeah, too. yeah, they're all like yeah, baseball like, films are I, good. I, I, like I may not like watching sports or playing sports, but I love watching a sports film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I like I don't think we've had a sports film with the exception of the greatest that uh, I haven't liked on this uh, podcast yet. So I'm really looking forward to this film. I do have high expectations. The bar is very high tonight, <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I don't really have much more to say than that. So uh, Thompson, I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to you. And I'm going to catch it. Thank you, Reginald. And honestly, I'm with you. I've, I've never seen this film outside of the Simpsons episode, um, which parody it. Uh, it's one of those films you, everyone knows about. They know about the Grand Slam. They know about the baseball bat made from lightning. So we know the basic beats of it. But with the cast and crew like it is, it's not going to be an exciting film. I'm sure it's not going to be Major League or The Sandlot. But I'm expecting to be a very solid film, a quality film if you will. It's a, it's a, it'll be a full course meal. It'll be steak, potatoes, greens, everything you could ask for. Maybe a little bit of cake at the end. That said, the bar is damn high, so there is a possibility it could not live up to the hype. But considering it's Bill Simmons has argued that any best sports movies list that doesn't either feature this movie or Hoosiers as the number one pick shouldn't even count. And considering ESPN has named it the sixth best sports movie of all time, I think it's going to live up to the hype. Okay, so it was number six. Okay, so yeah, I was a little off. But still, I mean, that's in the top ten. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of sports movies. There's like 30 of them in 2007 alone. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of really good sports movies. Like, And, and I, I remember that ESPN list had like Hoosiers on it and this movie. And I don't. I remember seeing the um, Field of Dreams, which is a great movie. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, there's a lot of really good sports movies out there. Yeah. I've never seen Field of Dreams either. So hopefully Oof. one day we'll That's get to That's another one we've got to get to. Yeah, yeah, if you guys want to hear me cry on air. We do. America yeah. does. So, America, if you want us to watch Field of Dreams, hit that like button and subscribe. <laughs> Man, he's jumping all the way to the end. Yeah, now. he is. He's doing the sign off. Um, I uh, thought I was bad. I, I'm stealing just, plates, guys. Just real quick, Tom. It's <laughs> real quick. It's funny, Tom. You mentioned Bill Simmons of ESPN. Uh, at the time, he was working for ESPN magazine. Just for fun, one day, he compiled Roy Hobbs' 1939 rookie season stats. Taking, yeah. cue, taking cues from the movie. His baseball card would have looked something like this. 115 games played, 400 at-bats, 92 runs, 140 hits, 44 home runs, 106 runs batted in, a 350 batting average. Hobbs would strike out 85 times, and he was walked 75 times. Obviously, rookie of the year. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I don't know baseball, and I know those numbers are broken. <laughs> Yeah, a 350 batting average is amazing for a rookie. A 350 batting, 300 is considered good in baseball. That's, you know, we we used to, we say that baseball is a sport where you fail 75 percent of the time and you're still considered a success. So, dowza, you know. dowza. But anyways, you got anything else, Tom, for expectations? No, no. I think I've. Uh, that's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting a solid three course meal out of this. All right. Well, you know what I am expecting tonight. You to lose the quiz again. No, no, no. I think if trends have been holding out, 
I'm expecting you to lose the quiz this time, Nigel. Well, well, I guess we'll just have to figure out or find out what other people have thought of this film. And Josh, have you? I was totally queuing up the movie. What are we doing? Oh, my God. <laughs> the guy has no clue what we're doing tonight. He is all out of order. <laughs> I'm out of order. You're out of order. Jesus. Josh is taking the field for the wrong team. <laughs> He's not even playing the right sport. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing, Josh? I'm playing shortstop. You're a right field, and we're at bat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was wondering why this guy had a different color hat on than me. <laughs> I thought it was a little odd. <laughs> he kept looking at me weird, and then he spit on my shoe. Like, get off the field. I just I didn't understand what he was saying. You're speaking nonsense, man. He's mean. <laughs> okay, so uh, the quiz for The Natural, where uh, hopefully we see Tom lose again, or we see Dan get shut out. We'll never know. <laughs> That's why we keep we play this game, because it keeps us on our toes. So, since neither of you like to go for me first, I'm going to go ahead and Dan. I'm going to let Dan go first this week. Yeah, you kind of have to let one of us. I do, I do. I was just thinking I could make me go first, but then it wouldn't be fair. I know all the answers. (laughs) What planet is Josh on tonight? (laughs) Holy shit. (laughs) So for those listening, Josh is uh, cleaning himself of caffeine. And uh, (laughs) yes, I think maybe, uh, yeah, might be a cost for some of this. Well, I just did the two-day no-caffeine thing Saturday and Sunday, and then today I've only had a sport or a pre-workout mix. So. <laughs> well, apparently it fried something in there. because Something, yeah, or I'm not firing on all cylinders. <laughs> if Josh was a spaceship, so... he'd be the Apollo 13 right about now. <laughs> hey, that was a successful failure, thank you very much. <laughs> hey, it does kind of fail. <laughs> <laughs> so, anywho, Nigel, first to you. This was wrote by Cam Letter 6 in August of 2001. The story is any nine-year-old boy's fantasy, but seems to be pitched to adults. um, I'm going to say six out of ten. Thompson? Hmm. This seems like a seven, but it's more than likely an eight. I'm going to say, but we can't go over, so I'm going to say seven. What would you say, Nigel? Six. Six. Nigel gets it. That was a one-star review. Oof. Wow. I almost really? said two. I almost said two because it felt like it was like, this guy didn't like this movie. Oh, I, I thought it was going to have something more nice behind it, but wow. Now, he proceeds to berate the entire movie. So, Ooh. yeah. All right. So, Thompson, DMS062724, mm-hmm. wrote in July of 2004, The Natural, while a departure from Malad's book, is a wonderful fantasy of promise, loss, and redemption. Is it promising, blah, 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 family, loss, and redemption, eight? Nigel? I'm going to say... Tom said eight. (laughs) Yep. I'm going to say nine. Nigel got that one. That was a ten-star review. I had... I... it tasted like a 10 star too <laughs> after I said it. Oh boy. Uh oh. Oh, yep. You are down by two now, Thompson. Oh, but we're still like not even halfway through the game. Nope, nope, nope. All right. Let's see. Dan, this one's to you. Scott Paris 18 said in October of 2020 you get the feeling that this was written as a star vehicle for Robert Redford, that Duvall, Close, and Brimley were just there to make Redford look better. Just dressing and a little more. Ooh. Just dressing and a little more. Um, I'm going to say a three. Damn it, he, Thompson? he's probably right. I'm going to say five. Oh, and Dan with the closest. That was a two-star. Mm. Damn it, I, I almost said I two. Should. I almost said two. I'll say two. I should have said two. Uh oh, spaghetti Yeah, oh, I'm at four. Three. I'm at four. No, I'm no, at three. Three. Oh, three. Yeah, because you've got all three right so far. But I have, if I nail it out of the park on these next two, I can, I can clinch it. You can, st- you can win it. You got to get, you got, you got to tie it to get one on at least one of the next two on the head. Mm. But you got to get both right. So Tom, I am dash one three one said in January of two thousand. On average. Sports movies either leave me cold, make me laugh at the gymnastic stuff they put in, 
or on rare occasions, actually work and move me. Uh oh. And it's jingoistic, by the way. Uh oh, this. No, no, you. Oh God, hang on. This this one could land either way. I think this guy said that this did all three for me. I'm saying a one. Do you want me to read it again, Nigel? Uh, all that stood out was jingoistic. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> Might as well say problematic. Yeah, read it again. On average, sports movies either leave me cold, make me laugh at the jingoistic stuff they put in, or on rare occasions actually work and move me. Tom said one. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say eight, because I'm actually, I got a feeling that this one's going to be a positive review. So I'm going to go eight. Well, Dan's technically got the quiz next week, because that was an eight-star review. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay, now. No, as soon as you said it again, it's like you mentioned on the rare occasion. It's like, no, oh, that qualifier, rare occasion. This is the rare occasion. Damn it. Oh. Okay, well, let's hear the last one. I want to at least get something on the board. <laughs> All right. So, Matthew Silverhammer 2 said in March of 2018, I don't fault this movie for its cheesiness, as it wears it so confidently on its pinstripe sleeves. I believe this one is to Tom. And this is a seven. Nigel? What was it again? And it was actually my, you were supposed to read it to me, but yeah. Or I was supposed to go first. Tom went on the last one, but. Did he? Oh, yeah. my bad. I'm sorry. That's no, okay. Tom said seven. Maybe you already I won this. Fall. You won this already. So let me have a pity. Oh, fine. Okay. I, you know what? Don't read it back to me again. I'll just say five. Dan would have got it. It was. A <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. Not, not even a one. In baseball Six. terminology, we call this a laugher. Dude, dude. I just want to point out now. That Tom got shut out six to nothing. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Dan's got his groove back. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. Do you want to hear the uh the tiebreaker question? Yeah, let's hear the tiebreaker. I'm modestly curious. All right. Angel Honesty 27 said in February of 2020. The only reason this film is worth watching is the cast. Robert Redford, Glenn Close, Robert Duvall, Kim Bassinger, and Barbara Hershey. All great actors that bring life to this film and keep you wanting to watch more of them. Nigel, you want to take this one first? Yeah, I'm going to say nine. Three. Dan said nine. Tom would have got it. That was a five-star review. Hey, I got technically one. No, but you... No, technically got one. That's the only used if there's a... uh, You go into overtime. Because it's a tie game. It wasn't a tie game, so it doesn't count. Sorry, Tom. But we love you. But you know what? What? Tom, play the music. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome back to another grand slamming episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and bat boy, Tom! Wait, do they even still have bat boys? Seriously, what was the point of them? Couldn't they have got someone else to fetch the bats? Or, you know, have the batters get them for themselves? But what was the deal there? But thank you for still being a relevant and necessary feature for us here at the Fire Pit. The team is swinging for the fences as the Fire Pit strikes out another natural on the way to the Big 42. Here's hoping this round of the journey is a little bit easier than the last greatest one from last week. But on that note, what say we peek out from the dugout and see how the team's enjoying America's greatest pastime? Welcome to another exciting game of baseball here for the Intramural Podcast Sports Type Tournament. And what a brilliant day it is. This is your Rob's Custom PC Broadcast Team. I'm Don Klinger. And I'm Rick Ruckish. And I'm Stevie Dreamy Smalls. And we got a game for you today. Woo! It's the Fire Pit Podcast going head to head with Caramel Chameleon Cooking Podcast. The Fire Pit coming off a surprise and victory in the last round. Some call it luck, some call it a deal with the devil. But 
Will it hold out today? Strange that they only have three players. I thought you needed more than that for baseball. Well, Don, joke only works if you don't overthink it. Too true, Rick. Too true. How many times have we heard that? At least once an episode. But it's a fire pitch tearing that bat, and batting for the Fire Pit Podcast is Tom, the great hope from the last round. That's an odd looking piece of equipment he's packing there. He takes the plate, lines up his stance, pitcher nods, there's a heater! And it's a hit! It's a hit! Down goes the pitcher. You only see that happen once in a blue moon. Oh, his mama's gonna feel that one. Tom advances. The fire pit is on the board. What a way to start the game. And going on into the next inning, we got Josh pitching for the fire pit. I saw this boy during some of the practice rounds they had earlier. He was on fire. The first battle from the Caramel is striding up. And he's got a look of confidence as he walks right up to the plate. Both relative newcomers to baseball, though I hear the batter is known for kneading that pasta. So he's definitely got the arm strength to knock this one out of the park. Now, Don, what does kneading pasta have anything to do with baseball? Why doesn't he just go down to the Piggly Wiggly and pick him up some bite out there? Just call the game, Rick. All right, well, Josh sets. He sets again. And now he's setting a third time. Okay, now he's pulling back. Oh, here it comes. He brings the heat. Oh, Oh my God. He beaned the batter. And no, I don't mean he put beans in the batter. No, we know what you mean there, Rick. We're full of baseball knowledge, and that's at least a base hit. Oh, wait, wait, wait. The medics are taking the field, I think. Yes, the batter is unconscious, and he is not waking up. That's the fifth player today. How is this even legal? Someone's got to be given some receipts. And needs to call a lawyer, too. And speaking of lawyers, we want to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, Bob's Lawyer Company. You bring the receipts, and they'll make sure they do lawyer things. I don't know, this, they, they, they kind of gave this this copy at the last minute and said, wait, we're not really good at going off the cuff like this. Stevie, you read that about as good as a young kid reading the Bible. Stick to the game, gentlemen. I don't even know what that means, Rick. And now, bottom of the seventh inning, and I've, I've got to say, I have never seen a game quite like this. The fire pit is down by an insurmountable amount. They've taken out so many of the other team's players, there's hardly anyone left. How the officials are still allowing this to continue baffles me. And now, taking the play for the fire pit, is Dan. It's his first chance at bat today, somehow. It doesn't make sense. And he's not holding a... He's not holding a bat. He seems to be carrying... Yes, I'm getting confirmation. That's the Book of the Dead. Dan seems to be raising his hand, and now he's chanting something. I can't quite make it out. Wait, wait, I'm getting word. I'm getting word from the dugout. Stand by. Yep, yep. Okay, so the Caramel Chameleon uh, coach is talking to officials. They're saying, screw this Dutch noise, we're out! They can have the goddamn game! Getting further reports from the field, and that is it! Yep, they have officially forfeited the match. And the fire pit wins the game and advances to the next level of the tournament. We, audience, I I understand it. We up here in the booth are all stunned. I have never encountered a game like this in all of my years. Our jaws drop faster than a... uh... No, I'm going to stop you right there, Rick. We don't want another lawsuit. What a sad day for baseball. Well, that's been it for our game. And until next time, I've been Don. And I've been Rick. And I've been Stevie. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Columbus United Network Television, SVC. Have fun outside. And that's how you win a baseball game, people. Terrify your opponents into submission.
But if you want to terrify us with your thoughts on the movie, or if you want to terrify people with how awesome your products are, feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line, as well as the reason you're emailing. Whether it is to commission an ad, recommend a destination, give us some feedback, or if you just want to have a quiet conversation with just the four of us, or however many people are emailing with you at the time, and let us know. And from there, we'll read it, send it to training camp, give it a few years in a farm league to see if it's ready and has what it takes to be with the big dogs, trade it away for the player we really wanted, and never respond. Maybe I'll have better luck in the Antarctic Leagues. Eh, them some breaks. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com Capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com Oh wait, holy shit, they actually need the bat now! I'm not redundant after all! I'm gonna go fetch some bats for a while. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. Bat boy to the rescue! Whee! And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. He showed up just in time. They're about to start putting them up the other end. Let's play a game. It's called How Long Can Josh Go Without Making a Penis Joke? Imagine, if you will, this hotel has no Wi-Fi, no TVs in any of the rooms, no pay-per-view porn. This is why most people committed suicides in hotels. I know, he's supposed to sit, play a young 20-year-old. They're clearly well into their 40s. Yeah, well, he, him and, yeah, Robert Redford and Glenn Close are born old. Oh, I get it. This is when the bat flies into his bedroom window, and that's when he just figures out that criminals are a superstitious and cowardly lot. And he is becomes batman bats scare me alfred it's time my enemy shared my dread (laughs) (laughs) the baseball team needs therapy damn and this was the 30s losing is a disease that's right yep this is definitely 1930s therapy losing is a disease he broke his knees with that pitch tied him up like a pretzel he's treading water He's jumping off the skyscraper. Look at him there. He's mopping the floors. None of these make sense. <laughs> I think Josh is looking at the janitor. <laughs> He's got his back turned. What? He's not even looking out on the field. <laughs> He's riding on the board. So he never went back home and banged Glenn Co- Close? He had a lot of time to think about that decision in the hospital after getting shot and decided that getting shot's not the worst thing that could happen in his life. So <laughs> He's not even going to try to catch it. <laughs> Jesus God! Oh my, what? Oh, what? <laughs> that escalated quickly. <laughs> he died running through a wall. What was on the other side of that wall? A crocodile pit? A gun. Somebody <laughs> shot him. <laughs> that was somebody shot Robert Redford. He's fine. Holy shit. Jesus Christ. <laughs> now I know why they called it the dead ball era. Holy shit. Wow. How to write off a character 101. Now we have the montage. Montage. Getting to the point with a montage. You're standing off the close, guys. I can't tell whether it's your toes on the or mine. That was my penis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got like, what, 10 minutes? That's cool. <laughs> okay, she does have a kid. I think it's being implied that it's his. Like right bef- probably right before he, well, no, because it's been 16 years. But, but she's be- saying he's at that age where he needs his father, and a teenager at that age, yeah, would for sure be at the right age, you know. Dude, a 16-year-old in 1930s? The man's got two mortgages. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. To be a baseball legend or to get to bang 80s Kim Basinger? <sighs> yes. <laughs> Anyone can be a baseball legend. Really pressing me against the beam here, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a 
bat in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? No, it's the bat. It's my bat. It's it's I the Wonder Boy. I, I take it wherever I go. <laughs> Only more interesting. Odds will make it more interesting. You won't make a difference. He's making a difference. Oh God! He's ruining everything. Sorry, I was expecting someone prettier. I mean, someone else. We are being really mean to Glenn Close. What kind of fucking name is that? It's so he'll always remember it. He'll take a memo. What's your daughter's name? Cardstock. <laughs> <laughs> Shattered a clock yesterday. They haven't fixed it yet. Did you think they would? <laughs> that costs a lot of money. There's a depression going on. Keep taunting a man with the gun. That's five bullets left in it. And there's only three other people in this room. That reminds me of back in, like, the height of uh, Titanic when um, Celine Dion, you know, you saw her husband was, like, 20 or 30 years older than her. Yeah. She's just attractive, you know, she was in her 30s then, and she's married to, like, a high 50s. I remember looking at my uh, teacher, and I was like, why would you be married to an old, ugly guy? And then I think it was a, she, she told me, she's like, you just don't understand love. Cause I was in middle school mm-hmm. and you know, as I've gotten older and I've gotten more experience and I've gotten wiser, I still ask <laughs> why, why was she with, with him? He was ugly. That's mean. That was very mean. He's recently passed too. The joke would landed better in my head. <laughs> Josh, that's a terrible story. Tom edit that out. Go pick me out a winner, Bobby. <laughs> no pressure. If it's the wrong one, though, you got to walk home with it shoved up your ass. Ah, it's the one he made. Ah. I just put a lot of time and effort into this one. You better not fucking break it. <laughs> okay. Just keep in mind, if I strike out, I'm holding your murder weapon. Glass is showering all over the audience. Blood! Blood everywhere! All the humanity! Electrical wires. Everybody's getting electrocuted. The entire stadium has been grounded. They are going up in flames. He dilled that pickle. <laughs> this is the worst thing to happen to baseball since Josh doing color commentary. Turns out she was his magic bat all along. Maybe the real Wonder Boy was the friends we made along the way. It wasn't. <laughs> Hell, Hydra. <laughs> <laughs> and now, back to the episode. All right, gentlemen. That was definitely the greatest movie I've seen this journey. <laughs> well, I mean, the bar was kind of low. <laughs> it was. Well, remember last week, we said if you want to love any movie more... Watch the greatest before. Oh, right. So this is, I would argue, is the best movie we have ever seen on this podcast relative to the movie that came before it. <laughs> All right. I'll allow the defense. Because <laughs> I don't know. I, I wanted to ask this question last week, but uh, the greatest rank on this podcast of terrible episodes. I would rank. Movies. Okay. Before we get into final thoughts, I would rank the greatest. It's. Above Pathfinder, but no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's above Pathfinder, but below um, Swashbuckler. So you think Swashbuckler was worth? How's it rate? With or no, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, like, okay, if I was like our worst movies we've watched oh, so from far top, from bottom. So the worst movie would be Pathfinder. Pathfinder's the worst. I would put the greatest at the next one up from that, and then Dead Calm, and then uh, or not Dead Calm, uh, Swashbuckler, then Dead Calm. That's mm. fair, Tom. Ooh, this is a hard one for me because each one is terrible in their own unique ways. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'd have to put it like almost right near the bottom. Uh, it's not the worst, though. That distinction still goes to, I think, Swashbuckler and Pathfinder. Dead Calm. It's it's neck and neck with Dead Calm. At least Dead Calm had a really grab you by the balls beginning and a what the fuck ending. So I guess it puts it slightly above the greatest. So for me, it would have to be Pathfinder, uh, Swashbuckler, the greatest, 
Dead Calm. See, for me, it would be True Grit, <laughs> Shootist. Ma, he's greatest. joking. Mom, he's joking, I swear. <laughs> no, I didn't like any of those movies. But no, no, I do agree with you, but I would throw The Shootist down there, too. The Shootist was bad, but it definitely was better than The Greatest. Yeah, At least I, would, it was okay, I could give that to it. Shootist was better than The Greatest. Yeah, and The Shootist had some good acting in it. It was just, I don't know, this, the story was boring, but the acting was good. Yeah, yeah. So, I do say that in jest, but The Shootist isn't very much higher up. Well, you also come in with a uh, anti-Western bias. So we keep that in no, mind. No, no, too. I liked the two, the True Grit remake. I don't hate westerns. Back to the Future Part Three is awesome. That's not really a western. Anywho, so on to expectations. <laughs> we already did our expectations. We're doing final thought. What the hell's wrong with you tonight? <laughs> Paint fumes. Oh, Paint Jesus fumes. Christ, dude! Yeah, Can I think just... he's still suffering concussions from oh. the the fight last episode. Holy shit! Now remember my uh, my. Uh, paint fumes i went in earlier and realized that the vent to my bathroom wasn't in fact on oh my god so god. it's just been colors i'm gonna explain why he got really quiet at one point in time in the movie <laughs> we joked about that before but oh my god josh please for the love of god open a window don't die <laughs> holy i'm better god. now the goblin on my couch is just smiling at me well at least he's smiling yeah. So, Dad, before Josh actually does die of fume inhalation, what are your final thoughts on this film? Terrible. Moving on. <laughs> no. Actually, no, I really like this film. Like, a lot. Like, a lot more than I thought I would. Um, It's been so long since I've seen it. Uh, I only remembered the ending. I knew he hit the walk-off home run to end the movie, but I couldn't remember any of the other beats of this film. Mm -hmm. But really solid, good movie. I can see why it's up there with some of the best sports movies of all time. It's a little cliche, like the whole hitting the walk off home run to win the game at the end. But mm -hmm. then again, this is one of the first movies that did it. So just like Hoosiers did the whole underdog wins the title from the dominant super team storyline first. I'm not going to hold the, that against the natural because it did it first, or at least it was one of the first to do it. So I'm not going to hold it, hold that against it, but it was a good film, really good performances out of just about everybody in the principal cast. Really love the banter between um, Wilford Brimley and uh, the other coach, Red. Um, yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, my God. I love their banter. And I really liked Wilford Brimley's character. I liked him as that old gruff baseball manager guy. Like, I don't know. I just liked it. But, yeah, just solid performances from the whole cast. I really enjoyed Robert Duvall kind of being this dickhead reporter. <laughs> I liked the, the dad from The Christmas Story being uh, just this really – sleazy dude just i don't know just really good really good performances the whole movie um i really enjoyed watching it was a good watch it uh it was two hours but it didn't really feel like two hours because there was stuff going on in almost every scene mm -hmm. almost every scene was important that didn't feel like there was a whole lot of filler and a whole lot of exposition and so yeah i liked it uh but before i keep rambling about performances and stuff um josh what about you uh i really i could just parrot what you said i really enjoyed the film too um, I will, I don't share the, uh, with you, the, your feelings on how they didn't drag on. I did feel that it dragged on for a bit in certain scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, like, um, I, I'm not trying to say this is a negative to the film. Okay. I am, but I'm not saying that it detracted from my enjoyment of it. Like I would say some of it, it felt a little longer than it needed to be like, um, yeah, just, it was two, almost two and a half hours and it, it felt like a two and a half hour long film, but not like, uh. The Green Mile felt like a three hour long film. Like, remember that one was just like, okay, that was definitely three hours of my life. I yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I agree with Dan. I don't think that there was any, any scene that it could have gone without. Like, I think scenes could have been shortened. I think everything had its purpose. I think some things could have been explained a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, like with the whole uh, girlfriend curse type thing. And when he was banging Vicky Vale. Like, yeah, they, I they mentioned that. that, but they really didn't dig into deep on why he went. Uh, he just had a bad game, or what she was really doing to cause him to uh, be a bad player. Obviously, it was just the dichotomy between her versus Glenn Close as the angel, and then the <laughs> whole subplot with the son that just felt like it was barely mentioned, and then it came out of nowhere for him to hit that home run, and then it ends with him playing ball with his son. It's just like it feels like it. I don't want to say it came out of nowhere because at least it had a little bit of lead in, but, but that, yeah, it was just, go ahead. 
No, you go on. You go on. Yeah. But um, overall, no, it was a really good movie. Um, I do recall seeing it before. A lot of the beats of the movie I was slowly recalling as I was watching it. Him getting shot, him uh, having the bad, the slump, and then all that. But overall, I did like this movie. I really enjoyed the movie. I definitely would watch it again. Now, Thompson, what about you? Well, I'm going to add to some of your thoughts, too, here. Um, yeah, this film definitely had a pacing issue for me. It's It was a very slow movie, literally. I mean, the big moment of him actually proving himself as a baseball player in the game didn't happen until 40 minutes in. And, yeah, the director really liked his slow motion shots. You talk about the runtime being two and a half hours and could cut down. Yeah, you could have cut down down a lot by cutting out the slow motion. Hell, the first 10 minutes of the film were in slow motion, pretty much. Yeah, it could have been an hour and a half if you would have just got rid of the slow motion. (laughs) You're not wrong, I don't think. And there's a lot of stuff with the story, too. I just... I like this film. Don't get me wrong. It was an enjoyable film to watch, but it wasn't a great film. I I disagree with a lot of the hype behind this film. There wasn't a lot of a character journey for Robert Redford. I mean, he got shot and then he showed up on the team. It's like, I'm here. There was no no between. There was nothing that showed he belo- deserved to be on there. Uh, there was nothing he ever really did to show he had earned anything. There were some superficial issues for him to uh, overcome, like the Wilford Brimley coach saying, I'm not going to play you, kid. But that resolved itself. He's like, I'll give you a shot after all. It, he didn't really have any agency. He just flowed from moment to moment. He was dragged along by evil character and evil machinations. And honestly, the evil machinations just felt tacked on so there would be some kind of drama in the background. Mm. And I kept thinking to myself, watching, it's like, this is pretty much the same plot to Major League. There's without the comedy. Con- yeah, without the comedy. They're conspiring to make this a losing team so they can like take ownership. I mean, they're not moving it to Florida, this one, but it's about the same thing. Mm-hmm. And maybe it goes back to what you were saying, Josh. That it, it this or Nigel, excuse me, that this codified a lot of the baseball tropes, at least the baseball movie tropes of the underdog team. There's shit in the beginning, but they start turning it around. Bop, 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 bop. You play this movie at the same time with like Angels in the Outfield, Major League Rookie of the Year. Not, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but it's not like exactly something that's going to draw you in. It's just, it did not reinvent the baseball movie genre at yeah, all. Yeah, okay. Now that I'm listening to you guys and I'm not changing my opinion, I still think this was a good movie. It was a, I enjoyed watching it. Like, I can see why this was number six in that mm-hmm. list of, of greatest sports movies ever. Because honestly, Hoosiers is a much better film. Yeah, I agree. Oh, yeah. You know, I, like agree Hoosiers, yeah Hoosiers, I think Hoosiers is a much better film. And as far as other baseball movies go, I think Field of Dreams blows this one out of the water, knocks it out of the park. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, into home. yeah i think field of dreams is better i think i honestly think a league of their own is better yeah. um you know and like tom said and i didn't even realize that tom until you said it this movie is the plot to major league without the comedy <laughs> never seen major league so i can't comment okay well basically it's the same plot just more comedic <laughs> beats it's i got that an the- owner an owner is trying to tank the team she puts together the worst possible team so that they lose so that she can sell the team for a cheaper price and move them to florida mm-hmm. i mean that this same plot only this one has darren mcgavin who um before i let you have your continue your thoughts nigel wholly underrated he wasn't he, he didn't even have credit he wasn't credited in this they brought him in the last minute but holy hell he was great at being a villain yeah oh the my glass god eye guy? yeah the glass eye guy yeah oh, the- he was really good yeah he was so slimy like he was one of those characters that's like you hate him by just like the first three minutes you've seen him it's yeah like, you don't know why you just hate him it's like that's why you can always say a bad uh guy or a good actor playing a bad guy like uh wyatt russell in uh the new falcon and the winter soldier mm-hmm or uh, Joffrey from Game of Thrones before the writers became the bad guys. He was a bad guy, and he did it so good. You hated him. 
mm-hmm. because he was such a good actor. I felt like that guy was not quite on par with those other ones, but he's definitely there. Oh, agreed. Because he's like, he wasn't over the top with his villainy, but oh my mm-hmm. God, he was so good at it. But I wanted to give him some kudos there because such a yeah. great actor. But Nigel and then Josh, you, you guys continue additions to this thought here. But I was going to say on your point, Tom, the uh, character arc, thinking about it now, it's just like, I did acknowledge this during the movie, but it didn't really come to f- like full bloom until you mentioned that. But he really didn't have any motivations in this film except just play baseball. Yeah. Like at some point he wanted to defend the game for pop. Mm-hmm. But it's like there really wasn't any chemistry between him. I don't want to say there wasn't any, any chemi- chemistry. There was a little bit of chemistry. But it's just like pop benched him for like games, several games. Where does his loyalty come from for this guy? Because he lets you start playing? Yeah. They did this whole thing where they were trying to make them, him this mysterious character. It's like, even before he got shot, oh, yeah. it's like, he's got a backstory, but we can't tell you about it. And I get kind of what they were trying to do there, but it robbed him of any personality, any real yeah. drive. Honestly, honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, you know, just the more and more I'm going over the movie, Robert Redford's character really is a Mary Sue in this movie. It kind of is like mm-hmm. he doesn't really earn anything in this film, you know, and I can't I got to be fair. I mean, if I'm going to harp on the Star Wars movies with Ray, I'm going to say the same things about Robert Redford's character in this film. Uh, uh, Roy, like he he comes in and he was like this naturally great baseball player. Then he gets shot and then it flash forward 16 years later and he's on the team. And mm-hmm. like Tom said, he doesn't really earn anything. And almost all of his conflicts resolve themselves. So, mm-hmm. yeah. It's like he's got a kid, but that's background but honestly, stuff. There's no play in this. Yeah, but, go ahead. And then it has no bearing on the story. Like the whole kid plot, you could have yeah, taken that out of the movie. You could not. Yeah. You could have taken that entire kid part out of the movie, and it would have been the same film. It bared no. It had no bearing on the plot at all. Yeah, I think Armageddon did it better when they had that one kid's dad show up you know and he gave like i want to give him the space plastic space show. yeah mm-hmm. i thought that entire sub arc was better than this kid arc <laughs> in this movie. yeah i agree yes yeah hell the superman kid in freaking superman returns made more sense and i fucking hated that subplot but glenn close kind of hinting not hinting outright telling him but still kind of being coy about the fact that you know he's you've got a kid and he really could use his father now and it's like but why they never show the kid doing anything that would make you imply that he needs his father they don't show the kid that he's like a troublemaker or he's falling in with gangs or he's he's i don't know what 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 did bad kids do in the 30s (laughs) you know (laughs) smoke cigarettes and roll them up and and grease their hair yeah no, you know, that, they not, did that anyway. Yeah, no, that was in the fifties. No, that was in the fifties. No, like what did bad kids do in the thirties? I don't know. He's he's running booze with Al Capone or something. I don't know. Just, <laughs> but they don't do that. They don't show the kid doing anything that would imply that he needs his father in his life. We didn't even see the kid until the end of the film, and then like <laughs> when he was playing baseball with him right after his home run, you're like, who the fuck is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah Max just... Lord's kid at the end of Wonder Woman eighty four. It's about the same freaking thing here. Yeah, it made no sense. It kind of feels tacked on. You could have taken the entire subplot out. It would have been the same film. Mm-hmm. It, like I said, they don't do anything to like when she says, well, he really needs his father at this age, but they don't do anything. They don't show you not one scene of why that kid needs his father or why yeah. that kid's not a good kid or, or could be troubled or could be heading down a wrong path. And the romantic thing with Glenn Close at the beginnings, they're in love. And then he goes to bang another chick as soon as he gets to the city. And then she comes back. And so it's like, oh, you're back. I'm also banging this other blonde. Um, But thank you for showing up. What was even her point uh, other than to be the angel character? There's a lot of superficiality in this damn film. I'm starting to really turn on it now, guys. It's oh my Me god. Too. Oh my god. Oh yeah, god. same here. I, I started this final thoughts just glowing, and now I'm replaying the movie in my head as we're talking, and I'm like, yeah, there's parts about this film I don't really like, and they're bothering me more than they probably should. Yeah, like it's it's like what this movie is, is it feels like is there's a lot of uh like you said, it's the tropes. It established a lot of these tropes. Like this movie was great in eighty four. But it only stayed number one for two weeks, whereas Ghostbusters stayed number one for like 13. And, <laughs> yeah. um, 
<laughs> but I don't think this movie would stand very good in modern cinema. Like where Hoosiers, I think, does a great job competing against modern basketball films. I think when you compare this one with modern baseball films, it just doesn't have the depth necessary to really compete. Like I think it's good purely on a nostalgia ride. I would agree wholeheartedly. And I think that's why people liked it so much. And so regard, I mean, cinematography wise, costume wise, the whole, like capturing the 1930s look, at least I don't know so much about the feel, but definitely the aesthetics, the tropes and the aesthetics are what really drive this film. If you, if you're into the superficiality, I can see why you dig it, but man, yeah, it's like, I don't, I don't have any issues with the direction of the film, the sets. I didn't hell. I thought the acting was amazing. The major flaw with this movie is the story. Mm -hmm. Like I thought Robert Redford to turn a phrase, knocked it out of the park. (laughs) Yeah. But even he was kind of bland. Any, any actor, I mean, his character was bland, but I didn't think Robert Redford turned in a bad performance. I thought he did a great job. He didn't have any range though. The more I think about it, he was fairly cardboard. In a, to a degree, yeah, he didn't need to. Um, think of it as Cool Hand Luke. Compare it to Cool Hand Luke. Remember how we was talking Cool Hand Luke? Ernest Borgnine's character was the show of that one. Mm-hmm. He made that film, whereas Cool Hand Luke, you know, Paul Newman was just like boring. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't Ernest Borgnine. It was, um, oh, shit. It was, um, oh, shit, yeah. he- help, me, help me out. I see him. He was, um, he George... was a, the- he was in the dirt. Georgia door. Ah, fuck. He was in something. Dirty Dozen. Lord, um, we love him. He's one of the best actors we've seen on this yeah, podcast. Ernest Borgnine was in the second, was in the Flight of the Phoenix. And he was great George in Kennedy. that. George Kennedy, thank you. Oh my God. Thank Saving the day. Yeah, Clinch George play. Kennedy. Yeah, it's like he he's the one who stole the show in that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the leading man didn't quite do it. I don't think this movie quite had somebody like George Kennedy to save the day. But Wilford I didn't Brimley. Think maybe, yeah, maybe Wilford Brimley. But I don't think that, uh, like I said, I don't think that Robert Redford turned in a bad performance, but I think Robert Redford did a really good job performing as Robert Redford. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, don't, I think the character was kind of bland. I agree with you there. What were you saying, Dan? I was just saying I agree. Like, you know, Redford, to me, I'm going back on his, his other films, has given better performances, but he's had more to do in those movies. This movie is really is. He's a Mary Sue. Yeah. It's almost the same as Flash Gordon. You start wondering, well, why is everybody getting behind this guy? He's done nothing for you to want to get behind him. Now, he does earn that a little bit in the natural. He People don't start getting behind him until he can start hitting home runs pretty much on command. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Better, Way better than Flash Gordon with, you know, he shows up on their planet and all of a sudden he's their George Washington for whatever reason. This movie tracks a little bit better than that, but it's still kind of like really hokey in how it just nothing feels earned in this. Like he just doesn't do anything to really make me want to root for him other than hit home runs. So yeah, mm-hmm. because that's his character. I mean, he tries to play this stoic kid with the troubled history, but you're like, he played baseball on a farm and got shot. Mm-hmm. What happened six for that 16 years he played minor and it's like they don't even touch on it he's like he played on the minor semi-pros for two weeks Mm -hmm. that's it it's like okay then what you got moved to the major leagues so what did you do for 16 years oh just just act stoic robert it's fine nobody cares yeah i can see why people say well of course everyone says the book is better than the movie that's the rule not the exception i'm curious to see what they cut out of the book to make room for the movie because i'm sure they probably touched on a lot more of the stuff with the kid him climbing back up or trying again after 16 years these sorts of things that would have made the movie cut out the Mm. slow motion bullshit the whole back bullshit backstory with the kid you know cut out the cartoonish evil judge and robert duvall conspiring to destroy the team and put that stuff in show that and you have yourself a solid guy who's trying again story Mm -hmm. yeah you don't need the conflict the conflict is almost it's it's it makes for good drama but at the same time you know you can have internal conflict be just as good trying to overcome his demons type thing I feel like, yeah, I feel like you're right. I think that would have made a much better story. But no, that's like they tried to shoehorn in the uh, external conflict that he had no part in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, my opinion definitely has changed on this film. 
<laughs> I'm sorry yeah. I poisoned the film for you guys. Well, no, <laughs> I think no honestly, if, 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 like, I, I'll be honest. Um, I think if we had just not done final thoughts and turned off the movie and all of us went to bed, I would probably be having these thoughts as the night went on or mm-hmm. into tomorrow morning as I start replaying the movie in my head because I, I am thinking about it now and I'm like, yeah, this there's a lot about this movie I didn't like. Mm. And I can see why it's been so long since I've seen it, but I watch major league and I watch a league of their own and I watch field of dreams and Hoosiers and stuff all the time. So, yeah. Uh, so I would not, I wasn't going to recommend this film anyways, because it's way too middling and piddling and the villains are too cart, almost too cartoonishly evil in their plot to be, palatable to modern audiences but especially after now that we've really dissected it i'm I'm, at least randy newman put in good music yeah Yeah, it felt like a felt like a 1930s soundtrack yes and the look was good the costumes were great the performances were excellent even um even robert redford in his you know most cardboard robert redford performance yet Wilford Brimley stole the show and Der- no Darren McGavin stole the show for me in every mm-hmm. scene he was in but the rest the it's not the worst film we've watched but it's 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 definitely I think I think this film tracks about like Robert Redford's performance according to you cardboard Mm-mm. this is a cardboard yeah. film it yeah, looks it, it uh I think yeah I think it does it's fueled on a nostalgic high so if you love this movie and you don't don't like us dogging on it, we're sorry, but <laughs> we're not cardboard. wrong. We're not wrong. It's cardboard. Wrong. Nigel. <laughs> cardboard. Cardboard. Unanimously cardboard. Yeah. Yeah. As I need to thinking... codify our uh, rating system. So cardboard is. Uh... <laughs> yeah. And I am not I'm not changing my opinion just so I sound like we're all agreeing. In fact, my favorite final thoughts are when all three of us have a different opinion on the film. Mm-hmm. But I'm I can't. I don't know. The longer I think about this movie, the more I'm like, I don't, I'm not liking it. Yeah. Not as bad as the yeah. greatest was last week, but it's, it's, it wasn't a great film. <laughs> no. Yeah. Give me Hoosiers. Yeah. Or, Hoosiers yeah. is way better. Or just give me major league. We'll, we'll watch the, the best, the, the funny, better version of this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like Cause this then movie, get, you could stupid. just fast forward through all of it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it'd still be an hour long, but. But at least it would be playing at normal speed, you know. (laughs) I've never, it's been a while since I've seen a movie where two hours goes by and the the main character is the same person he was in the first frame. Yeah. (laughs) We turned on this movie hard. We did. We yeah, did. I I don't think we turned on a movie this hard since freaking Dead Calm. Dead Calm. Dead, Dead Calm, yeah. Even Green Mile took a till like a day or two before I just turned Venom on it. Wow! Well, but I think I still love your turn in Dead Calm. You literally went from being okay with that movie to outright revolting it. This movie's better than Dead Calm. I still see the aesthetic appeal. It's oh, not. Yeah, it's revolting. like I said. I think there's plenty about this movie to enjoy, but I just think the story is not one of them. I th- Agreed. I think it, it belongs on the list of greatest sports movies ever, but number six is, is generous. You know what I mean? Like yeah. number six is generous. So, cause I could definitely, I could definitely, I could definitely think of five movies better than this one, including next week's film. So Ooh. Oh, yeah. I've seen Rudy recently. I know I'm going to enjoy that one. Yeah. Yes. Spoiler alert. We're going to be watching Rudy next week. So, uh, anyone else got anything to nope, add? I think that's, uh, it. No, All right. Not. I can make an uncomfortable penis joke. So we went from cheering the hell out of this movie and being its best friend to uh, leg dropping the shit of it and joining the NWO. So uh, that does it for tonight's show. And uh, as always, as a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, wherever fine podcasts are sold, wherever you choose to download your podcasts. Regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6 p.m. And that is the actual Tuesday, not what Josh thinks is Tuesday. Please like and subscribe whatever medium you choose to listen to us on. We really appreciate it. It helps us out. And uh, when you do listen to us, please be sure to leave a review. Uh, They really help our podcast grow and they help us show up in searches. So if uh, you're listening to uh, movie podcasts, we'll get recommended to you from other movie podcasts or we'll get recommended if you're looking up something from this movie. So be sure to leave a review.
And be sure to join our Discord channel as well. Uh, an invite is in this episode description. Or, or, this is a new one, guys. You can go to discord.me slash fire pit. Mm, nice. Discord dot slash, or was it discord dot me? Discord dot me slash fire pit. Yeah. That is your quick and easy way to join our Discord channel. But I, I got to shout out the, I'm going to do this a second early, to GMP and Wink of the Shattered Order podcast because it led me to the site to sign up for it. And we are discord.me slash fire pit. So, so discord.u slash fire pit? Tom, stop. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, discord.me slash fire pit. Quick and easy. You go there, click join. You're in our server and you get to uh, discuss new episodes, past episodes. It's a great time. Everybody there is awesome. We love having conversations. And um, you can tell me how awesome I am and how bad the other two are and how I should start my own podcast. But I won't because seriously, half the fun of this podcast is the chemistry we have. Plus, he needs me to edit this for him. And I he... need Tom to edit. I wasn't going to say it, but that's really the reason I'm still on this. <laughs> I'm useful. Yay, me. <laughs> but if you want to tell us more about how useful we are or you yell at us for um, being wrong about this film, but don't want anyone else to hear it, you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. You know, if you want to send us a long message, short message, happy message, or a sad message, it's up to you. We discuss a little bit more in the interspersal segment, but also like our page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at firepitcce. Both linked in this episode's description as well. Excellent. Thank you. So any shout outs, Nigel? No, I don't I don't know anybody. I'm just kidding. Uh, special shout out to you, Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, special shout out to all of our listeners out there, uh, especially our friends on Discord, Rob, Tarek Thorne, Danielle. They're all there joining the conversations. Uh, Wink and... Uh, Punk from the Shattered Order podcast are on the Discord as well, uh, joining in on our talks now weekly, talking about whatever movie we watch, what movies we will watch, what movies we might watch. So special shout out to all of those folks. And I would like to give a special shout out to my parents who are probably going to give me a lot of shit for this episode. Um, I love you guys. And I don't look forward to talking to you about this. <laughs> Josh hates another movie. They I'm love. kidding. I love you. No, they give me shit every time that I, I talk about a movie. I forget what movie it was. Swing Vote. It was Swing really? Vote. It was funny, yes, because they like that movie. And then they just didn't like how uh, I my opinion turned on it. But what's funny is then I talked to my dad about it. And he's like, yeah, it was a good movie, just a good watch. And I eventually got him. like, so you thought it was pretty mediocre? For, yeah, yeah. So, so you'd say it would be like a five out of ten. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I say. <laughs> I love you, Dad. <laughs> and and a special, special shout out to my wife for being the most amazing woman in the world and not giving me a lot of shit for recording on a Monday because I was useless this weekend. And I he, love you, and you are amazing. Yes, and he totally didn't throw this in at the last minute as we finished up this recording. At I'll all. edit that out. <laughs> what you're saying, keep what I'm saying in <laughs> And I'd like to give a shout out to Zencaster, who's been uh, helping us record this podcast. Gotta give it some love because it has saved our butts and our recording so many times. It is a choice recording software. We don't pay for it, and they're not paying us to say anything good about it. But if you ever want to do a podcast for yourself, we cannot recommend it enough. And I'd also like to shout out uh, some of our Facebook followers out there. Adams. Kolucci and Chikowski, uh, just three of the hundreds of Facebook followers who come in whenever they can, uh, whether you're just following to follow, whether you're an active listener and spreading the word, or just like hearing geeks be geeks. We want to thank you for joining us and helping to keep the fire pits burning. We should just quickly tack on Sync Lounge and Plex too, because Sync Lounge has been a lot easier lately in keeping it, allowing us. Yes, to Yes, it has. It's a godsend. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, if yeah. you ever want to do like uh, people were talking about, like why Netflix doesn't have anything like that, but Sync Lounge is great for Plex. You know, share what movies you want to watch with your friends. It synchronizes the time, so Down it's like to the second. So it's like when we make a comment, and all three of us are 
streaming it down to the second. So it's like we're all seeing the same thing on screen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Sync Lounge as well, shouting out to you. And if you want to pay us for more shout outs, we won't say no to. We won't. We won't. But uh, do you guys hear that? that? It's off in the distance. It's like a low murmur. It's like a chanting. Rudy, 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 Rudy. We suck at this. <laughs> but yes, I think that is the movie that we are going to be watching next week. Rudy, 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 Rudy. I think Tom just intentionally did <laughs> that. He is not as good as Sync No, Lounge. that's Tom is the reason why we use Sync Lounge. <laughs> yes. But until next time, I've been Tom. He's doing it. Oh, I'm like, sorry. I thought, okay. <laughs> Who's not reading the script now? <laughs> I'm out of sync, remember? <laughs> God damn it, Tom. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening tonight. Until next week, I've been Dan. I've been Josh. I've been Tom. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. All right, guys. Well, we got another baseball game in a couple weeks, so let's try practicing some fly balls. <laughs> and, well, I know with this magic bat, there's nothing I can't hit. Ready when you are, Josh. I did not agree to any of this. Too bad. Pop fly. Ah! Damn it. Oh, brother. Oh, God, that's going to leave a mark. Oh, man. my head. What is this? Ow. How did it hit us both? Oh, shit. Is that even possible? Oh, he made it possible. So that's the recurring joke for this journey. All right. Why do I want to put lights on a Subaru?